met our keynote speaker, Nora Denzel, um, two years ago. We have a, an annual uh, census of uh, women business leaders in California, and we, we have an event, and this, this one was in uh, the Bay Area a couple of years ago, and Nora came and uh, she spoke. She was absolutely riveting. She was uh, wise and funny, and I then tried to get her to come, come speak uh, here to you. It's taken me a couple of years, but here she, here she is. Nora's uh, talk was um, really to a, a standing room only uh, crowd. And, and uh, I, uh, anyway, I'm going to let, uh, let you be a judge of, uh, of Nora's uh, um, wisdom and, uh, and good sense. When I met her, she had just left Hewlett Packard. Uh, she had risen to senior vice president of HP's global software business, and she led the division to double-digit uh, growth. And today, uh, after a two-year break, she's one, the youngest uh, uh, retired person I had ever met, but, uh, two, and I actually, when, I have to tell you, when she spoke at, at our event, she, she had just stepped down and she, she got up to the microphone, just like I am now, she, and she pointed to herself, this is the new look of retirement. Of course, she cracked everybody up. But today she is back from retirement. Um, she's senior vice president and general manager at Intuit. She leads uh, one of the software company's fastest uh, growing units, uh, which offer payroll services to small businesses. They are headquartered in Silicon Valley, and Intuit is a leading provider of business and financial management solutions. And I think many of you know their products, uh, QuickIn, QuickBooks, and TurboTax. Uh, they have 8,000 employees, a 2.6 billion in uh, um, revenue, and th this company has been recognized as America's most admired software company and one of the country's best places to work. Nora began her career as an engineer at IBM and, and advanced very quickly during her 13 years with IBM. She became one of IBM's youngest executives at the age of 33. She earned her bachelor's degree in computer science from the State University of New York and her MBA from Santa Clara University. She serves on the board of directors for Overland Inc., the Support Network, and the Anita Borg Institute. Uh, today she's going to uh, share with us what she learned as she climbed the corporate ladder at IBM at Hewlett Packard. She's going to offer us some good advice in her talk the top 10 ways you shoot yourself in the foot at the workplace. So please uh, uh, join me in welcoming Nora Denzel. Okay, well, Nicole, thank you. What an excellent uh, introduction. Um, certainly not well-deserved, but I'll take it. And that's one of the career advice I'll give you is anybody who says something nice about you, just say, say thank you. That was uh, excellent. Um, as Nicole mentioned, I'm an SVP at Intuit. So hopefully, how many of you use in TurboTax? All right, and if you're not, why not? I need to ask. <laughs> it's never too early to start your taxes, so uh, uh, we have that. We actually also have really great, Quicken is online now. It's totally cool. You have to try, try that. So that's my shameless plug, but it is an awesome company. So um, it is voted many times one of the top places to work in the world. So I'm Nora Denzel, and um, what happened in my career was I was, I, I guess, are you always an engineer if you have a CS degree? Is there like a statute of limitations on how long you are in, the, uh, in your undergrad. So I started as an engineer at IBM, and I became like the queen priestess of sto computer storage. I know that makes many of you jealous. I've been on the cover, I've been on the cover of Storage Magazine. Maybe you have that issue, but Computer Storage <laughs> Magazine, I have been on the cover. I'll, I'll sign it in the back at the end. And so people always asked me about storage. So I was, in, I was used to being interviewed and talking about computer storage. And once in a while, a question would come up about being a woman engineer in the glass ceiling. And I just got really trained at answering it and then going right back to computer storage. But the prevailing wisdom at the time was there was a glass ceiling that would prevent women from uh, going further. And this one reporter actually asked me if I felt women shot themselves in the foot in the workplace, which totally threw me for a loop because no one heretofore had blamed it on us. They always blamed it on them holding us down. And so I was like, oh my goodness. 
um, it really it just set me thinking, and I thought, well, there are things that women do sometimes to shoot themselves in the foot in the workplace, and if I ever, you know, I codified it into 10 things that I would see as traits, but as I started talking about that and became popular, I realized men would come to, in the audience, and um, I'd always ask, why are the men here if it's called, why do women shoot themselves in the foot in the workplace? And they'd answer by saying, well, that's where the women are, that's why we're here, so... <laughs> Uh, but then they said, hey, it was applicable to us, too, so I changed it to this is, these are the things that I've seen in my career um, of how you shoot yourselves in the foot in the workplace. And this is really aimed at those of you, I know that I'm an older generation, and our generation was about greed. There's nothing wrong with it. You watch the movie Wall Street, greed was good. We were very ambitious coming out. I was reading an article in the USA Today that said, and it was today, that uh, it's really about doing doing good for society and doing no evil, etc. And I think there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But I also think that doing well for yourself allows you a platform to also do bigger things. So there's nothing wrong with ambition. You might not want to call it that because it's probably politically incorrect in the next decade. But then I'll tell you this, greed will come back, you know, and then doing social good will... So it all, it, it comes, it, like the 60s was about doing well, 80s was greed, so it's going to come back. So it's okay to have some ambition. And this is about how not to squelch your own ambition. So I put together, these are the top 10 ways not to shoot yourself in the foot in the workplace. So number one, I call this one, you have to control your own PR agent. Your own PR agent is you. A lot of you think whatever is known about you in the industry is because other people are saying things. The problem is every time you open your mouth, you're issuing a press release about yourself. You're putting this information out on the wires, and you have to be very careful. If you really are ambitious and want to move up, you want to start putting out press releases of, I'm pretty competent, I'd like to move up, and I'm career-oriented. Sometimes people forget that what they say is starting to position them as a brand in the workplace. So let me give you some examples. Now, this is, I'll give you d gender-specific ones. Sometimes women have trouble accepting compliments. It's, a, it's the funniest thing. When someone accuses you of being competent, you actually try to talk them out of it. So you'll know you'll have this. I'll take it through your personal life. If I compliment you on your outfit, how many of you know how to say thank you? I'm glad you like it. And how many of you actually say, oh, this? I bought it at Marshall's. It doesn't really fit, and there's a hole in the back. Does that ever, <laughs> does that, has anybody ever suffered from this? How it transverses in the workplace is I say, hey, that was an awesome, you know, Nicole, that was, an, that was a great presentation that you had here. Somebody as experienced as Nicole says, thank you. If she wants to say a little more, she'll say, I'm glad you enjoyed it. So she's not getting braggadocious, she's not getting a big head, but she says, I, w w what really happened there is there was a transaction of, Nicole, I think you're competent, and she says, thank you. And she's also agreeing, yeah, I pretty much am, and thank you for noticing it. Some women say, oh my God, you like that? That's not my best work. Oh, I was really tired. You know, this thing, I'm going to step down, I'm going through my head, you know, is that the right, you know, I'm worried about the new building. You know, I didn't, you know, half those numbers were wrong. They were wrong. <laughs> and I'm sitting there thinking, wow, you know, I have, a, I have a mental ledger as a senior VP. I'm always recruiting, always thinking who I'm going to put on the team. So, you, so I'm saying, Nicole, I put you on the right side of the ledger of, you got assets, I think maybe someday. And what she's saying, no, put me over here, put me over here. And it's funny because other people will try to sink your career. It's rare that you do it to yourself. And you're going, yeah, no, I'm not really that good. I wasn't a good dean. I've got to tell you, I was not very good. I didn't know my material. Never really, you know, I don't understand, you know, what I'm doing at the university. She's putting out a press release, and every time you open your mouth in the business. So there's a ton of work. I think Tom Peters was the best. He's got this whole thing about you are your own brand. I think just like a credit check, you should be doing a brand check on your own self. And if you really actually want to move up, you might want to make sure that the things you say are conducive to that. In my own career, for example, when I was at IBM, they wanted me to take a, this great job, but the only thing about it that I didn't like it was in Tucson, Arizona. So I said, okay, I'll take it. There's nothing wrong with Tucson, but, uh, you know, my husband lives here, so I'll just commute and I'll make it transparent that I'm commuting. And so it was hell. I mean, it was just, you know the America West flight attendants better than you know yourself, you know the... the um, airline schedules. Once in a while, though, we'd get the Phoenix Suns plane. That was actually kind of nice because the legroom was phenomenal. It was like first, play, first class the whole time because America West was the flight. But the rest of it was pretty terrible. But people ask you in the hall, how's it going? Right then, you've got a moment of truth of a press release. So are you saying, now the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth was, I hate it. 
I've missed every birthday party, every life event. You know, I, I, you know, I never know what city I'm in. I'm not eating right. I don't exercise. I'm always off my game, and I cannot wait till this ends. I mean, that's the truth. You might want to minimize that just a little and say something like, <laughs> uh, I'm learning new things. I mean, you don't want to lie ever, but you also don't want, you know, somehow some of you stood in the, the integrity line, you know, in the gene pool a little too long of like, I need to now say everything that just came to my mind. So those are some of the things that I would say is control your own PR. What's out there you put out, and in this internet age, it doesn't even disappear. It's not like you whispered in the hall, I'm having trouble, because it translates to she's not tough enough to be an exec. What if we actually gave her a big, huge corporate job? She would never move. Boy, she's whining about taking the, you know, it's, it's, it's a nonstop to Tucson. No, it isn't. You go through Phoenix. But, but that's what they think. And so be careful and remember that you control your own PR. Everything out there, 90% of it you did. Number two, if you really want to move up, just aim high. This is how I learned this was one day I was in the airport shuttle with my boss, Judy, and I had been working five years. And so I knew, I didn't really have goals. Now, some of you already know your goals, which is awesome. I had no idea. I just kind of stumbled in and just decided I'll pay off my school loans. And then happiness never really had set in. It was more about financial security, paying off school loans, getting a car, et cetera. And so Judy asked me what I wanted to be at the end. Now, in these days, you, some of you won't believe this, but we stayed at our company's 30 years. I know that's, an, that's something foreign to many of you, but people stayed and had long careers, so everyone just assumed at IBM I would be there for 30 or 40 years. So she said at the end, which is 30 or 40 years later at IBM, what, what is it you want to do? So I had never thought about it, and I didn't realize this was one of those moments of truth, so I just, just said whatever's on the top of my head of, you know, I'd like to be a third-line manager. And so in, in non-IBM speak, you're managing about 100 people total, and those 100 people go into two sets of management layers. So there's first line managers, second line, and you're the third line. You've got about 150 people in your org. So Judy's doing the math, figuring out you're going to be here 40 years, and you're going to manage, you know, 150 people. She just said to me, never say this again. And I was like, <laughs> so I thought, well, did I swear? What on earth did I do to offend this woman? I said, what? She said, if, you know, someone as bright as you, whatever, you should never have such low goals. And I was thinking, I don't even have a goal. But I was thinking, I've got to get her off my back, because she's going to ask me again. So my point is, I had no idea what I wanted to be, no idea if I wanted to move up or not, but I just knew she was angry. So I was thinking, all right, I need to have a career goal. So I decided, I don't know what I want to do. I have no idea what these other people in big positions do, but I don't want to be caught flat-footed again when they ask me. And I thought, what if, what if I was somebody that did have a career goal, what would it be? So I made it up. I basically said, I want to head all the software at IBM. I just said that. I thought asking for the CEO would be a little high, because of the pedigree I had, et cetera, I didn't think that that was in the cards and that might put people off. So I said, if I just say I'm a software engineer, I want to head all the software, perhaps I will buy, you know, I will buy entry into the second round of the questioning. So I just basically said that. It was amazing after I articulated a goal how things changed. And I remember the whole thing was made up. I just said it to get through the conversation. But I really learned, and I really tell you, either you have a goal, which is phenomenal. Some of you got your lives in order. You had different parents in mind, and you've got the whole thing chunked out, and you, you're actually in control. Others of you are saying, I don't know. I'm not sure what I will like. But I know that by stating a goal, other people edited it for me and gave me tons of advice. And I was also sent to cl special classes and lots of training. I think I showed some competence. I think that's got to come in. But also by articulating it, people then started to see me as that or, or telling me you're not going to ever be that and giving me better advice of why don't you move over to something else. So a lot of people say, you know, I don't have a goal. My point is just aim high. And so some of you are thinking, I don't know. Do I want to be a senior exec? Isn't there wear and tear? What if I have children? What if I don't have children? What if we have a nanny? What if my spouse relocates? My recommendation is just ask for it, aim high, and you can always turn it down. But, but you take yourself off the list when you do that little Tourette syndrome thing of, I don't know, I'm like, my God, Jesus, I want someone, even if they're a little bit less skilled, that wants it, I put them in than somebody that's like, hey, I don't know what I really want to do. Now, remember, this is all about doing better, you know, do, moving up, you know, so you can do better in the society. So if you really do want to move up, aim high, articulate it early and often, let people edit it for you and get that advice. It's way better than saying, I don't know. And actually what happened at IBM was, so I said it and I became an executive and then one day they called me in the office and said, okay, this is it. 
You're the few, the proud, the brave, the strong. We want you to go on assignment to our chairman. The chairman was Louis Gerstner at the time and, and, uh, in upstate New York and lived there for a while, and then we'll dispatch you out. And that was my big ticket to the show. And I ended up turning it down. I mean, I did end up turning it down. It felt really bad. Actually, it changed my life because I went to a, a startup, and then, then my entire life changed. So it was probably the best thing that ever happened to me. But um, just articulate it. And when the moment of truth comes, you always can say, look, I, I can't take it. I've got to wash my hair. I, you, know, you can always take yourself off <laughs> after offered. But, you, but taking yourself off before it's offered, you might actually want it, even if you're unclear. Did that make any sense to you? Because it made a ton of sense to me. Okay, good. <laughs> okay, number three. Oh, my God, learn how to ask. Learn how to ask. Now, I hate to do the gender thing. I have men, not only that knew how to ask, they would tell me what they were going to have. I'm their manager. I had this guy that I managed named Mike. And at IBM, the manager was kind of the gateway to everything. And Mike not only knew how to ask, he would tell. He'd come in my office and tell me, I am going to go on international assignment. And, and you remember, the manager is the key to your whole entire life. And he comes into me saying, I'm going to go on an international assignment. And I would just humor him. Oh, yeah, really? Do you know where? No, I don't know where, but you know, you're going to send me and I'm going to go. And when I'm there, this is what my kids are going to do. I want them to learn a language. And I was just listening to him. Just trying to be nice, waiting for the opinion survey so I could get a good grade and move him out, right? But what happened later was um, I was in a meeting, and it was, there was tons of things on the agenda. We were very hurried, and my manager mentioned that SAS Airlines needed an, an engineer with Mike skills that wanted to live, and to be honest, I have no idea what country it was. It was Scandinavia, so it's one of those countries over there. And, so I, and they said, will he live in that cold part of the world? For, do you know anyone that would give up their living here to live there. And I was like, I might know someone. Within 48 hours, I swear to God, Mike is on a plane. He'd already decided where he was going to put his stuff and rent his house, etc. <laughs> I had a new hire, Anne, and she runs into my office breathless one day, and I said, what is it? She goes, Mike, he's going on an international assignment. I said, yes. She goes, oh my God, I might like that one day. Where was it posted? Anne somehow was raised to believe that everything's fair, yeah, the smarter people get promoted before the dumber people. Yeah, and that, uh, that riches and everything only go to the best. So there's a pecking order, and the success police sit in the back room and sort it out, and they make sure that everything's fair, and everything's posted, and you all have equal opportunity. And she also thought that her manager read her mind. You know, that like psychologically or like ESP-wise, I knew, you know, that she wanted to go on an assignment. She didn't really get that everything happens... It's almost like when your husband has a remote. It just goes so fast. You're just like in a meeting, somebody needs somebody to go. You're like, yep, Mike can go. Okay, the next topic. I mean, you're just going so fast. You're not really sitting back saying, this is my department. Who deserves it more? Who would like it more? You got a guy, you put, send me to Scandinavia. You have a Scandinavia. You do a match.com, they're gone. You don't, it's not really, I hate to break it to you. Maybe in other, in other industries, but high tech, I have not found to be the fair and just land of the, of the world. So my only point is learn how to ask. Later, same job, I'm still a first-line manager living my lie, and I have this big epiphany. What, I don't know what they do, and if I'm actually asked to be the head of software, what if I don't like it? Maybe I need to edit my lie based on some actual practical experience. So I thought to myself, what would I do? Now, this is way before Take Your Child to Work Day and shadow programs. So I just invented in my head, I'm going to go meet with our senior vice president and ask him, can I spend a week with him and shadow him and see what he does? And I just got all my courage up. I got on his calendar. I don't think he knew what to do with me. I just said, hey, can I spend a week with you? And he looked at me. I said, in work. And I said, because uh, <laughs> I said, I someday might want your job. Now, he's like 90, and I'm like 15. And he said, I said, not right away. I'm not going to take it right away. He's like, I'm, I'm not really worried. So he got nervous, and he said, okay, fine. I think he just said it to shut me up. So for a whole week, I just went to every meeting with him, walking around, and he was wonderful. I learned more in that week than I did the whole five years I had been at the company. He was so good as a mentor. He'd stop his meeting five to seven minutes early, and he would tell me, this is what I was doing in there. That guy was trying to do this, and this guy wanted to take that. So what I did, and so I learned so much. And everyone was looking, where, why is Nora following that guy around? You know, why is she going in those doors? And Anne came to me. I still manage her. Couldn't get rid of her. And she comes in, and she says, uh, what were you doing? I said, oh, I was shadowing him. She goes, what's a shadow? I said, well, it's a word I made up to say that I spent a week with him just to, I didn't give her the whole lie part. Remember the whole PR thing? I just told her, I just wanted to see what he did. She goes, oh my God, that might be really fun. Where's that posted? How do I do it? <laughs> so that's the thing is just learn how to ask. Nicole met me and then she just hits me up 
ask me, can you come and speak? You know, and I, actually, it's funny because I come in your own suits and ties. When I went to school, honey, we didn't wear this. That's all I have to say. First of all, the CS majors weren't up at this hour. And second of all, we didn't have clothes like this when I was in school. I mean, we didn't, we didn't dress. It was like, this was like a funeral or a wedding. So that's kind of, <laughs> it's kind of freaking me out. Okay, so just learn how to ask. I cannot tell you how many things you get when you ask. And not only in your professional life, but also your personal life. I was in Bed Bath & Beyond. I wanted to buy one of those Emerald Lagasse sets of cookware. I had a 20% off coupon. Do you have it up here? Do you know how important those coupons are? You do? Okay, good. And it says right on the bottom, except Emerald Lagasse cookware. So I went up, put on a face, and just said, and the lady let me have it. It's amazing. Even when it's written in writing, you have to check out at 11, Emerald Lagasse cookware. You start asking, you cannot believe the goods and services that you rack up. So get your courage up, learn how to ask. For the men, okay, so if you're already asking, learn to be like Mike and learn how to tell. For the women that are afraid to ask, just learn to ask. And so there's like three levels. It's like a PhD level is telling people what you're going to be. The, the graduate level is asking, and then the undergrad clearly is. They don't know how to do that. Number three, I would say what really helps in a career is you've got to lighten up and separate. So this one is really a twofer. Um, you will be offended. You'll, you will be frustrated. These are things that are normal. I think that's why they call it work and not play. I'm not sure. But um, a lot of times people don't understand that in work, there's unlimited wants and limited resources. So when finance is cutting your budget, they're not the evil, mean, mean person in finance. That's just the role they're playing. And if, if you did the play again and you were the person of finance, you would do that. I find sometimes women especially don't get that it's all a simulation game. I mean, it's all just this parts of a play. And they'll avoid them and not keep, they'll ruin a relationship because someone's against their proposal rather than understanding, look, it's an opponent or an adversary. This is what's happening. This is how we navigate. It's really funny. My husband comes home from work, and I say, how are you? Good. Anything happened? No. And you read in the paper, his, his company had the biggest layoff of all time. They're merging with another one. It's going, and you're like, you don't even know his boss's name. Where I'm saying, okay, she came in the meeting. She was wearing a dress I was wearing. She said this to me. <laughs> she said that, so I said this. You know? Lightening up and separating, when you separate that, it's just a simulation game. And ask yourself, if I was in his part, what would I be doing? People that get so involved, you're actually not a great employee, believe it or not. You want to just rem remain uh, objective, lighten up, let those things that, you know, I, um, I can't even give you a full accounting of everything that was offensive to me. You know, you're a woman in a male-dominated field. People just say things. They don't even mean it, and they just say things. And what I learned was, in the corporate environment, information is incredibly important. And if, you're, if you put out these barbs of, you know, you better not... Say that I'm a bad driver, that offends me. I mean, I actually am a bad driver, it doesn't offend me. But, but um, if you send that out, no one will talk to you. So you really have to lighten up on the things that you find. Now, obviously, there's a legal, moral, ethical. Those things are off the table. But things that really irked me, I was quiet about until I ran the unit, and then I could change the environment. So I have hair-raising stories of things that people said to me, or what they said about other women, or what they said about other things. But by lightening up and separating, it really makes you go, for, you know, misery is optional. That's what I really learned is I'm not going to, I just, I'm not going to allow you to make me miserable in the job. I'm going to stay as long as I learn things. And then when I run it, I'm going to fire you. But until then, <laughs> you know, yeah, that's what you have to think. I mean, this was, I won't go through because I don't think we have time, but I have a thousand examples. And maybe you do in your environment where you got a little bit too close to the flame. What up? Cut it out. I mean, it's, it's a job, people. It's just a job, and, 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 and you get so close to it, you're kind of psycho Sally. You really don't want to be that way. You want to make sure you lighten up and you separate. Number five, okay, I have to do this as a, it's, it, I call it, you have to kill Miss Congeniality, but I realize with the men in the audience, you might not even understand. So I'm going to explain it, but then I'll give you a, a sports analogy, because, <laughs> you know, for God's sake, how many sports analogies I've said. I don't watch football. The next time I play it will be the first time I play it. I, I did tea parties, field hockey. But anyway, kill Miss Congeniality, what this basically is, is when I grew up, and this is so politically incorrect, so don't raise your hands, they had this thing called the Miss America pageant. I don't even know if they do anymore, but in this, this, this part you are not going to believe. They would send these, it was for women, and they send these women out in, in bikinis and high heels, two things that you wear at the same time, all the time, right? And they literally would say how tall and how much they weighed. 
It was almost like, I grew up on a beef cattle farm, it was almost like the auction, you know, when they bring out a cow. Like, they bring out these women, they say, you know, this is Miss Idaho, she's 10 feet tall, she weighs 8 ounces. <laughs> and I would watch it, I always watched to see if I could fit in the metrics, and I, well, unfortunately, I thought, like, at least Miss Montana I could take, but no, I was not, <laughs> you know, you didn't have a shot with some of those girls. But the other thing I noticed doing that research as I was year after year, the girls in the pageant vote for one of the prizes. So the judges judge them on whatever their talent, their skill, their essay question. But the girls vote who's the nicest one, and they call it Miss Congeniality. That's, it's not done by judges, it's done by everyone that hung out with them for a week. And what I noticed year after year after year, Miss Congeniality never won the contest. That woman that everyone picked well, that was the darn sweetest never won. There were girls there that came to win and won. And there were girls there that, I don't know if you want to actually win Miss Congeniality, but they would win it and feel proud of it, but they never won. They never got the scholarships. They got like suave shampoo or something like that, but they didn't win the contest. And so what I mean by that is if you were raised in that way, and maybe you were, of, oh my God, if somebody's yelling at you, you better make them feel comfortable. Maybe you caused that. Maybe you should, don't ever yell back. Or, um, you know, your boss... There's no money, so he can't give you a raise, so you sympathize with him. You would never speak up. I mean, that would be wrong. And so that's what Miss Congeniality does. But she's not in the corner office. That's the issue. If you're coming to win the pageant and to move up, when people ask you, like, for example, I'll give you an example. When I was at IBM, third year in, they wanted me, me to be the United Way coordinator. I thought it was great. I did it. It was phenomenal. I met local community leaders. I still give to this day. I can go on for hours on how that changed my life. It was great. But it also takes up a lot of time, and I was very career-oriented. So the next year, in their infinite wisdom, they came to me again and said, would you do this again? And what they're really saying is, will you do this for your adult life? Will you be the sucker that we're going to give the United Way campaign to the rest of your adult life because everyone else won't take it? But they don't say it that way. They say it a different way of, you're the best coordinator we ever had, and this is really great. What I'd learned was I already learned enough from it to show that I, A, give, and B, can understand it well enough to get the numbers up but I don't need to do it the rest of my life. Miss Congeniality would do it and then feel bad if she said no. Miss Texas, on the other hand, with those big hair and teeth, she ain't doing it three years in a row. Don't get me wrong. Now, I'm not, there's nothing wrong with Texas, but they win a lot. I'm telling you, they, this, it's rigged. They win a lot. So in the football analogy, what I would say is you want to be the quarterback. That's what you want to be. Going up through the engineering rank, I wanted to run a division. Because I, I don't know why, people would say, you know, you'd be great in human resources. There's nothing wrong with human resources. People actually major in it, have incredible careers. There's a whole Human Resources Hall of Fame. I wasn't interested in it. I wanted to be something else. I wanted to be the division head. I think Miss Congeniality would feel troubled by that and feel that, they, that she should do what was being asked. And, you know, I better behave. I better not make a fuss. It's really funny giving out raises. I have a woman come to me and I say, hey, you have done a great job and everyone loves you. They love you. People go up and down the hall, I'm telling the truth, and they love you. But I have to tell you something, I'm sorry, we just do not have money in the budget. You saw the earnings, you know, I'm so sorry, your envelope is empty. She's fine, she doesn't even come back to me. You say that to a man, he's like, hey, if there's no money, I get it, but, you know, I might have to go. You know, they don't have an issue with being Mr. Congeniality. So I think in the man's world, if you're playing football, if they ask you, you know, you don't want to be the water boy, right? You want to be the, the uh, quarterback. And you have to make sure what you're doing is on your agenda and being nice it may not get you the end. So that's number five. Number six, what helps you a ton, especially if you move up quickly and you're really young in your roles or inexperienced, you have to learn how to act. That has saved me a thousand times because you're sitting in a, we were talking earlier, had I met Bill Gates. I have met Bill Gates and I was petrified. I mean, absolutely petrified. There was no way I could get out of the meeting other than quitting. And it was like, it was probably too late to quit. I probably didn't have anybody to call, and I had to do it. You're scared. I mean, he's going to know your SAT scores by looking at you. You don't think he does? I mean, he's got, he, he, they, they know everything at Microsoft. Maybe you guys wouldn't be scared of Bill Gates, but when I was uh, at my second company, I was a corporate officer, and on our board was the CEO of 3Com and the CEO of Informix and these two huge venture capitalists. I'm sitting there going, how did I get in the room? Maybe you wouldn't be scared by that, but maybe there are things that you are just a little nervous. I was the youngest, the only girl, managing all these male engineers. And they'd always say, oh, you're younger than my son. It's like, well, whatever. But, you know, you still have to do that. And you're kind of scared, a little bit scared. Or you're a consultant, and you have to go in and meet with the CEO of GE to tell him how to do manufacturing better. Learning how to act gets you through it all. 
I mean, you just act like some, act as if you're confident. Or just act like someone who is confident. Pick out someone and act like them. A lot of people say, well, isn't that disingenuous? I don't think it's disingenuous because when you start to act, you forget who you are, and then eventually you turn into that anyway, so the whole thing becomes a blur. So I, think, I don't think it's disingenuous. I think you, you cut yourself and you, you um, shoot yourself in the foot by saying, oh, my God, it's the first time we've ever had the lunch, and I'm really scared, and I didn't know if anybody would come. It doesn't really give you a great image. I actually, when I did take the time off, actually got methods of how to act. I didn't even realize it's a major. I mean, that whole thing is like an entire major, and you, there are techniques to it. So I really learned what professionals do. I'm no good at it, but um, I think that that helps you through all those times that you're feeling like, I don't know what to do. And that goes into number seven. You have to feel comfortable with being uncomfortable, and some of you don't. So what happens is if you really want to run something, you're usually multidisciplined. You come from somewhere, so I come from engineering, but you also have to understand finance, legal, all the you know, corporate communications, marketing. And so you move around a bit, and it's uncomfortable. And um, sometimes people get so uncomfortable, they go right back to where they came. I better just stay in engineering because I feel really comfortable there. I feel that I have the depth and the breadth that I can do that, but as I moved, God, I was uncomfortable. The first time I was a new supervisor, the first time I did almost anything. You have to learn that it's just like a sport. If you're not feeling uncomfortable, you're not learning. And just like a sport, you're sore in the beginning, like the beginning of ski season, that horror show we call the first couple weeks, and then, then it starts feeling okay. And that's the same thing as you move. Now, it might be you are having a huge allergic reaction to something, but what I recommend is put a date in your, in your notebook six months out and just tell yourself, I'm not even going to think about how I feel for six months. And if I still truly hate it and I'm sick to my stomach every morning, then I'll give myself permission to come back. But until then, I think a lot of careers are stunted because you went, you tried, you got scared, and you went right back. And you always dreamt of what you could have been. So now I'm so, on the other side of that is I always strive to be the dumbest person in the room. And for me, that's pretty easy most of the time, but sometimes it's hard. But you want to be the dumbest one in the room because you learn the most. Did you ever, were you ever on a sports team and you were the best? You don't learn a thing. And you actually, you atrophy a bit. You get a little cocky. It's not good for you. It's really good to be in the majors when you're not really ready. I'll tell you, you learn the fastest. So when, you, when you're the dumbest one in the room, you're much more open to learning. You learn a lot every day, and you grow a ton. So in this new job, I'm in the small, medium business segment. It's all about internet marketing. It came from the enterprise where we called on customers individually. We sold 1,000 things for millions of dollars. Now we sell millions of things for hundreds of dollars. Totally different. It's very humbling to sit at a table and know that every single person knows more than you do about the subject matter. But it's like a whole renaissance in your mind of learning. And it keeps you nimble, keeps you sharp, it lets you get your analytical skills faster because you have to go quickly because these guys are going to figure out that you don't know a thing. So striving to be the dumbest, I know it sounds very much opposite of what, you know, you're trained from UC Davis, you have this MBA, you're smarter than most people, but it's really when you are overmatched when you learn the most. So you, but you have to be so secure in yourself or so psychotic that it's okay with you, that it's okay that I don't know and you tell the truth, you also build them up by saying you're the expert in search engine optimization or you're the expert in, in uh, social marketing. Teach me. Oh, my God, people just open up like, they just open up like books when you admit it. When you try to bluff, not so good. So that was for the men in the audience on the bluffing part. Okay, um, number eight, this one's huge. This one, if I could, for me personally, and you'll have your own, this one's huge, embrace criticism. Criticism is your friend, and for some of you, it'll be the gift that just keeps on giving. I mean, it is, it is awesome. And some of you get a little defensive. I don't know, I had a different set of parents than most of you. My parents are like, you know, uh, you're not good enough, you're really horrible at everything. If the teacher complained, they weren't the ones hiring lawyers for the teacher, they were the ones yelling at us. I mean, they, they didn't take anybody's side other than whoever made a complaint. It's very different than the hovercraft parents we have of today. So we were raised of like, you're no good. You'll amount to nothing. You know, your life, as you know it, is pretty terrible. But um, I think that understanding that criticism from the right people is extremely helpful. Somebody's actually taking the time to give you a message that's hard to hear, but is actually there to help you. So what I've seen, a lot of times these guys, they come out, 
They got a, so okay, when I was a girl, you're not gonna believe it, went, went up hill to school, went up hill back, no, that's a lie, but um, when we played sports, only one person got an MVP trophy. When we played softball, people batted, and if you struck out, you struck out. I've gone to these t-ball games now, everybody gets an op, everybody gets a trophy, and so you might not be used to feedback or criticism, you know, and you might not be able to accept it because maybe, you know, you have never had it before. But once you open your mind to it, it is phenomenal. When you get that real curmudgeon boss that's never happy, those are the ones you want to have. Those are the ones when you learn. And if you really open your mind, so sometimes I'm given a performance review or just some coaching, and I notice the defensiveness and this whole big human shield comes up. Then I hear later, you're trying to convince everybody in the hall, you know what she said? And she's wrong, she's wrong, she's wrong, she said this. She actually had the gumption to say this. And I'm thinking to myself, that's the last amount of career advice I'd be giving you because I'm really busy. It's a pain in the neck to give. You clearly can't handle it. But the sad part is you're, you're shooting your own self in the foot and you're stunting your own career growth. You've got to, again, this is the twisted mind part. You have to say to yourself, criticism is a gift. So we've got a boss now who is phenomenal, comes from West Virginia. And I, if it's not the nicest state in the country, I don't know what is. He, it's very hard for him to say anything that's less than positive. But my job is to pull that out of him. Just pull it out, you know, to act up so much that he's got to say what's wrong. But no, you've got to really, really ask him. He's the CEO, he's hugely talented. He can help you, but it's against his nature to say anything. And so what you really have to do is learn how to ask him in the right way, in the right setting, to get the feedback that you need. Crave criticism, accept it, and know that it's a gift and you will soar. Now, the other thing though I get in the Q&A typically is, what if you get some feedback and you don't believe in it? There's two responses. One is, if, if your boss, like in an appraisal session, says something, whatever it is, just ask clarifying questions and say thank you, that's it. Don't start your defense, please. Some of your legal majors don't start that. Just say thank you. Get 24 or 48 hours in between, and then go back in a calm way, give them credit, thank them for what they gave you, and then do your side of the story in a very nice way, just to make sure, I'm not sure you had all the details, but what really had, you know, so you can do that, but in a nice way, but not right up front, because they'll stop the criticism. The other thing you want to do is pattern matching. If you're, so what happened, I, I had the first manager at IBM, he said all these bad things, I'm like, what up, I'm switching. So I switched, and then, and then the second manager, who didn't know him, said similar things. I'm like, oh God, would they all read the same book? I don't do any of that. But the third manager, when she was saying the same stuff, that's when I decided the only common denominator was me. And that's when I started to pattern match and say, you know, if three of them are saying the same thing, there might be a shred of truth in it, just like <laughs> this much. And then I started to embrace it, and then I started to soar because I accepted it. So those are my two points is sometimes you'll get someone that gives you criticism because of some weird event in their background that you had nothing to do with. If you don't hear it from anyone else ever, you're allowed to discount it. But if you're starting to hear little, your brand is starting to get... Um, tarnished, and, it, and you keep hearing the same thing, you better own that perception, and you better start to change it and tell people you're open to it, and, and really beg them for that. So criticism. There was a book called The Critical Edge. I don't know if they still print it. That was seminal in my learning in the, in the 90s. It's called The Critical Edge, and it was really about the gift that keeps on giving. Number nine, leaders have attitudes that they make the rules. And so what I mean by that is, especially if you're in large organizations, which I've, I've been in three large and one small, Rules exist for everyone to just kind of herd them all together. So you have to have salary grids, you have to have rules, or you have anarchy. But true leaders think in their heads that they make the rules. And that's what I look for, is someone brave enough to say that I, I realize we have a salary plan and I realize it's due on a certain date, but mine isn't done because I think we made a mistake when we hired these people, they're too low in pay. And so some of the managers think, oh, I'm going to tick and tie and turn it in on time and fit the grid and I don't want to cause any disruption, and they follow every rule. And they're afraid to get a yellow flag on the field of, what are you thinking? And they don't question the things. Really good leaders not only go into markets that are unknown, it's unknowable, and they think to themselves, I'm going I'm to shape it the way that I, I think it needs to be shaped. That's what leaders do. So I think you have to have that attitude of, I make the rules. So it's almost a line of asks of, um, how many of you, when you go to San Francisco and it says parking lot full, do you go, oh, darn it, and you just keep going? And how many just drive in? And, and what happens? Not, 
they find, somehow they're like, of course the guy comes up, like, didn't you see it? You go, oh, gosh, I'm sorry. You don't lie. Of course you saw it, but you're begging. He goes, look, just leave your car, you know, you idiot. <laughs> What'd you do? Because you, you have a mindset of, I make it. I decide if your lot's full. Now, does it work every time? And that's a, that's a trivial example. <laughs> but in the workplace, you've got to decide to pick your battles and decide. So at IBM, we were doing software in a hardware company, one of the hardest things you can ever do in your career. And it hadn't be done, been done before inside of IBM on a non-IBM platform because we're a hardware company. And you just have to decide that you can do that. And you have to be you know, sick enough to just keep going and learn how to present it in such a way that you get that done. That's what, that's what leaders are looking for in other leaders because as they age and mature, then they go into big markets and then they make bold steps. But the ones that are always ticked and tied and always sitting in the front of the class and whatever, those usually aren't the ones that I see in the very senior level. And that's where you shoot yourself in the foot is you think that you score points by um, doing everything the right way. Now, remember, pick your battle. You don't want to walk up and down the hall. I will not wear a badge. I will not sit in a chair. I will not, you know, you don't want to do that. <laughs> you got to decide. You got to really decide and then decide what it, is, what it is you do make the rules on. And the number 10, Always remember what you're judged on. I get asked a hundred times, well, first of all, the answer to that is results. Some of you might not have known that with the type of upbringing you had, but it is results. Um, but I get asked a hundred times, you know, should I join this networking group? Should I be in the alum group for the school? Should I, should I have a LinkedIn profile? Should I be on Spoke? Should I, whatever, what else do you kids do? Facebook, MySpace, oh, not MySpace. That's for like 10-year-olds, I got that. But <laughs> Facebook or uh, what are some of the newer ones? But the key is, if you want, okay, first of all, no one can give you employer security. Sorry, I wish they could. Maybe even, I don't even think a university can, even with tenure. Is it a guaranteed forever for the rest of your life? I don't, maybe, but I don't know. I, would, I don't think anything is, is permanent. But you can get employment security by having a track record of results. Remember what you're judged on. You're judged on results. And it's amazing to me how many people come in going, well, I didn't have results, but I said I needed eight programmers and I only got six. I'm thinking, there's no award for that. I mean, it's, it's an obstacle course, and we're seeing who can go to the end until the end of it. And there's no smooth path. And guess what? It only gets bigger obstacles as you move ahead. So we look for people, here's your sports analogy for the men, that you go down the court and you put the ball in. You don't say, well, there was five guys that were trying to prevent me. Well, well, <laughs> welcome to the city, children. I mean, what do you think? I mean, it's, it's results. Leaders figure out, and they have a consistent track record of results. No matter what company they join, no matter what the market is, no matter what they're doing, they figure out how to get results. That's what we're looking for. So, yeah, there is some stuff. Sometimes you can get a couple clicks up by looking better and not really doing anything. That means you don't have a great boss, and they, they, they were pretty misguided and they judge you on the wrong things. Ultimately, though, it all sorts out. There's very, very few very incompetent, incompetent people at the highest levels. It really winnows out quickly, and if you are just a stuffed suit, they'll know. But you could get a couple, you know, in lower levels, some people did look better and weren't doing better and, and moved up faster in the short run, but in the long run, they do get taken care of. So just remember that you're judged on results, and there's no credit for how hard it was. I, you know, what do you want, a violin? I mean, what do you want me to do? You know, it's hard. Competitors are trying to kill us every morning, and you're, like, stuck on that you asked for $100 and got 40 You know, it's like, that's, I don't know where they were taught that it's not about results. You know, and if it isn't going the right way, then you change it, and you figure out what you can do with what you have, but you don't sit and whine that you didn't get what you got. All right, so those are the 10. We have time uh, for Q&A, so who's going to be the first uh, for the Q? Oh, thank you. That's so nice. Thank you. Thank you. You're, thank you. You're well-dressed and polite. That's kind of like a, I just can't get over the suits and ties. I don't know, maybe you dress like that for class, but I, I cannot tell you the horror show called Computer Science If in the you 80s. would raise your hands, yes, we'll bring you a microphone. And Christy, there's a button on the bottom. So we have like 10 minutes and then we'll let you out of captivity. So ra raise your hand if you have a question. He runs a company, he's asking. This is kind of sad. <laughs> I don't think I can tell you I'm anything. curious if you have uh, recognized the huge disconnect between our um, K-12 system and your point number nine in terms of what you're taught to do <clears throat> and you're not supposed to, you know, you're not supposed to ask for forgiveness after you do it. So I'm curious what you think about that disconnect. No, I think there is 
a disconnect, but I also think that as you get into the workforce, so the way I learned I made the rules is I was working on a weekend, believe it or not, people did that in the 80s, and I was doing something, and that boss that I ended up shadowing happened to come in to pick up something and leave, and he said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm doing what my boss told me to do. He wanted me to test something out, and it was the dumbest thing to do. And my, the big leader said to me, do you always do what they ask you to do? And at that time, that was my K-12 of like, you mean there's a choice? Like I actually have a choice in the matter. So I definitely see the disconnect, but I think as you mature through the workforce, you have to um, understand what boundaries are movable or flexible and which ones aren't. And so I think that that's kind of a maturity as you move through. Yeah, so we started, so it's called 10%, actually we call ours unstructured time, and it was rolled out in the engineering community. And then we realized that innovation and unstructured time applies to everything, business models, the way that we market, the way that we do internal processes, the way that we interface with customers. So we have it across the company now. And as a leader, I'm certainly, I'm hugely encouraging of it, but I try it again as that framework and set them free. So the other day, for example, um, we have a very large young community of new engineers that come in and they're mixed with engineers that have been there longer or been in their careers like for me 20, over 20 years. So we took them and said, we're going to give you a whole day to work on anything you want and here's the framework. How can we use our products that we create today for social good? And just, just let yourself go. Come back with ideas and we're going to have a prize and we're going to, the CEO, myself and another business leader were the judges. And it was phenomenal. So that's how I get involved is I probably won't come up with the next great thing. Those days never happen for me and are over for others that are my age. But for them, they, so what they came up with, what, what, what was the winning idea was, as I mentioned, we pay 16 million people um, every two weeks. And what their idea was is what if we rounded up the paychecks with the employers and the employees' permission and donated that money to charity? You know, you wouldn't even notice one and 99 cents, between one and 99 cents every time you get a paycheck. And you want to do good, but you're too busy and you're going to school and you're working. What if you had a great way every time you were paid knowing you helped someone with a pair of shoes or a cleft palate? And so that's an example of leadership, putting a framework, unstructured time, kind of channeling them to what you want them to do, but not being too prescriptive, so it was just do good. But try to stay within the realm of financial management software, because that's, you know, if you come up with a new nuclear reactor, we're probably not going to get into that business, but if you use the, the tools we've given you. So there's an example of it, but it is widespread. It's very encouraged. And as a leader, you set the tone. Yes. Yes. I, I was very interested in your hierarchy of don't ask, ask, tell. Yeah. And I was interested, did you experience that differently at a, or do you, do you witness it differently at a middle management level and an executive level? Is it a different game? Is there a different risk That's reward good. Uh, mix? That's a great question. I think, um, Hmm. That's a good, you know, I still ask, like, um, you know, you ask a board member, can I just have dinner? And, and uh, the stakes are a little higher, though. You can't, um, I guess my point is, when I was not as, not as much scar tissue as I have now, I didn't even know what the stakes were. So I would just get you to lunch and just try to interrogate the heck out of you, of just like, what do you do and how do you do it? Dumb questions came out, smart questions came out, but there were, there wasn't a big risk. People say, wow, she's not that bright, but she was inquisitive at least. But, but I wasn't in charge of a, a huge P&L and whatever. I think at this level, the stakes are a little bit higher that whoever I'm interrogating plays golf with, you know, somebody else. You could, you know, lose a huge funding opportunity or you could, you have to be more um, deliberate at this level. I'm more deliberate. I, I really try to plan the whole meeting, the whole set of questions ahead, and understand that voicing a personal opinion about something I don't like in the company is much, it's got a huge downside. Where it, when I was an engineer, you know, I was just one of 10,000 people that didn't like it. Sure. Yeah, that's true. You know, I, I'm, me personally, I'm not a proponent of the tell. I think it's just a product of how I was raised. Um, but I've noticed some people are, yeah, you do. You know, it always depends on your boss. They're the gateway to everything, and some people didn't get that, and they fight with them. I mean, there's no fight you ever win with your boss, especially in the, in the short term. So me personally, I'm not a proponent of tell, but if you're so skilled at asking and you're getting stuff all the time and you want to raise your game, try that. But for most of us, 
I think the ask is, I, I was just saying the ask. And it's so funny, people are so afraid, and I always say, well, what is it you're going to lose? It's nothing. You just don't get what you asked for, but you didn't have it anyway. So it's like, I, and then I spoke at IBM one day, and this lady emailed me back. They, they had restricted all travel, and she wanted to go to Boston for some database conference. And uh, she asked her boss. Her boss felt so terrible that she couldn't send her. She ended up with some other parting gift. She got something else. It was like she just couldn't believe the windfall just by asking against a corporate travel ban, but the manager did something else, like sent her to San Francisco for, for, for something else. And so she just couldn't believe. She didn't get what she wanted, but she got a second prize, which was just as good. So, so you're amazed by what it is. Yes. So I am intrigued by the advice of being the dumbest person in the room. Um, but I have a couple questions about ahead, it. Honey. So how do you um, draw the line between being honest that you're not an expert but not being self-deprecating? Um, and also, how do you be realistic about what room you should be trying to get into? Like, not hmm. getting into a room that's too advanced for where you are. No, it's a, I think that's a very, um, very insightful question, I would say. So first of all, in my head, I want to always be with people that are better. Because, because of my natural tendency to slack off if I know that, you know, I'm in autopilot. Um, I don't raise my game unless there's somebody way better. And then you're thinking, man, I thought I was good, but he's better or she's better. So on what room to get in, I was probably remiss to say just the clear dumbest. The, my point is try not to have two learning curves at the same time. And so I'm from software. I'm in a software company. I'm not coming up to speed on what's a software business model. Who are, you know, I understand software. The learning curve I'm up against is the customer segment, which is small businesses, and I come from very, very, very large businesses. Um, so tr my point is figure out um, what is it you do know, and then move either forward or sideways from that. Because clearly, if you have absolutely no value whatsoever, and you can't even articulate how you remotely could be related, I'm trying to think of something that is just so obscure, and you can't even make up some lie about how you think that that's going to benefit, people might, um, people then might do that. So just do one learning curve at a time. So I know, I know how to be an executive, and I understand software. I'm not going up those curves. I'm not that, I have been an SVP before, and I have worked in software. But I threw myself into a room of these people that had subject matter expertise that I don't. But I'm hoping that they put up with me because I offer them something else that they don't have. They all want to move up and they want to have the amount of experience one day, and they don't have as much industry knowledge. So I think pick one, as long as there's one axis of a learning curve, be really dumb in that. And so that's what I would say. But don't be afraid of it. Yes, there's one over here. Oh, I probably should have gone there. Okay. I read a book. It was called The Soul of Money. It was awesome, and it was all about doing well and how you should view money. And the whole premise was we're, I wanted to do good in the world, and then I realized that I have a gift for making money and that, and that um, having more, I could do more with. I thought I was ready to go at 43, but I wasn't. And after two years, I realized I could make a much bigger difference. Some people can't attract money, but I can. And I might as well get more of it while I still can, and then I can give more later. So that was my big epiphany was it was too early for me personally, and the impact I wanted to make was limited by how much I had I still had, it was Lynn Twist is the author, she comes from San Francisco, it was a phenomenal book if you're interested about social good and, and doing well. And so that was my thing was I, I still have one more big job in me and with that then I can do much more than I was able to do um, without having one more big job. So I wouldn't say a financial motivation, I also still have the energy, the enthusiasm, the passion and I wanted to learn about SMB and software as a service. So I enjoyed that. I also liked the CEO. But the hugest one was, it was too early for me to go out. I'm predicting to live to 78. I was 43. I have one more five to seven year stint, and then I'll go you know, down the back 40 of my life. So that was my motivation. It's not cracked up. The first year is bliss. Too much leisure and too much um, decadence. Believe it or not, like everything else gets old. So I definitely recommend it. But make sure, if, in case you want to get back in, you keep some doors open. So don't burn anything when you leave. Just make sure that, because you may want to do it. You might want to do one more. Uh, Nora? Yes. 
I think we might have been in the same early retirement class that right, at, early at retirement. HP, and I was kind of curious the uh, the culture of innovation at HP versus at uh, Intuit. Can you tell me how you manage for innovation for uh, manage for innovation amongst your team and your staff, and how it's similar and different at HP versus uh, Intuit? Yeah, so it's it seems to me just to look at two study two companies studying them. HP is largely a hardware company, largely supply. Um, supply chain. There's a lot of innovation in how IT services are delivered, how, how you um, move PCs around the world to keep, you know, those are low margin businesses. So the degree of difficulty is very high and you have to be very, very precise. And I've seen a lot of innovation on those lines. It's not really known as a software company, although, I mean, it's $3 billion in software, which many people think is big, but over $100 billion company is still 3% of a company. Intuit is all software. And so we don't have many supply chain discussions, and it's managed much more, the innovation is managed much more as a process, where HP, I would argue, the processes were more around supply chain and the physical movement of goods. This is really around the intellectual capital. And so we have things like unstructured time. HP may by now, but they didn't uh, when I left. And the other thing is we allow innovation to happen and lots of ideas to percolate, and that's where luck comes in. And that's where the artistic and, you know, we're artists and leave us alone. But once it me reaches a maturation, then it is meticulously managed by Gates. And you want to make sure that luck meets a big business opportunity and it converts to money. So one of the things we did is at, at Intuit is realized managers are incapable of making the decisions of what's going to work or not because the, the world's moving too fast. And so every time a leader tries to pick what's the next big thing, they're usually wrong. So we started what's called Intuit Labs, and you can go online, and that's where we vet our new products. So our engineers are encouraged not to finish a product, but to throw it out on the web and then let customers iterate on it and tell us, and we design, design it with them. And we vote on products based on customer hits and customer um, feedback. And not on, it, it's not that big engineering process where requirements get winnowed down and some big deity comes out and decides we're going to do this and not this. The deity now is a thousand deities and they come from their own walks of life and they come in through Intuit Labs, which we let them in our engineering process. And it's been spawning other engineers wanting to add value on top of what we've created. So we take their input as well as their um, requirements. So it's a much different, it's kind of bottoms up engineering rather than tops down. And I think that's the difference between a software and a hardware company. So Nicole. Thank you. Isn't that nice? thank, thank you so much, Nora. And aren't you all glad that I know how to ask? <laughs> This was great. Um, I, this is, as I said, was, is our centennial year at Davis. And we have a centennial wine. We know about wine. And oh, we wow. have a bottle uh, of our centennial wine for Thank you. Thank you. Just and seen, if, is it a cork or a, I just wondered. Just a, it, this one is a cork. Okay. It's but not we, a we know about other kinds of closures, and we're really into innovation <laughs> uh, there, too. This is great. Uh, but Thank you. Th that was fabulous, and I, I, um, I'm so glad we, are, uh, we filmed this because uh, everybody's going to want to go back and uh, uh, take notes on it. Thank you so much, uh, all of you, for being part of this community, and thank you, Nora, for, for inspiring us. It's a great talk for not only the rest of this year, but for many of us for our careers ahead. Thank you. Thank you.